Hello and welcome to this episode of our Rhinoplasty for Residents and the Foundations of Facial Plastic Surgery webinar series. We really hope you have a great time watching this show. Well, thank you again for having me. It's a pleasure to speak with everyone. Uh, I, I've got to say, since I posted the little webinar announcement on my Instagram, I started getting a couple notes about from patients about whether I do rhinoplasty and how much it costs in South Africa. So I'll, I'll be happy to send those patients on towards you. Um, but uh, so uh, you know, Hamza asked me to speak about upper blepharoplasty today. So I'll start in the beginning by talking about a little bit of the nuts and bolts, but really I wanna talk about probably the two or three biggest reasons for dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction with blepharoplasty because really the procedure itself it's simple. You're excising a set amount of skin, maybe muscle, maybe fat. But the key is to know what adjunctive procedures to add to take your result from a, pass, a passable or average result to an, a phenomenal result. So um, before we talk about surgery itself, these are some red flags that you should try and screen patients out that you may not want to offer blepharoplasty for. So uh, the first four of these relate to the cornea. So preoperative dry eye. Now every patient who undergoes blepharoplasty is going to have temporary dry eye after surgery. And this is less related to the amount of skin that you take and much more related to the fact that you're disturbing the orbicularis muscle. So when you touch it, when you inject local into it, when you cauterize it, you're reducing the strength of the orbicularis and it never returns to its complete function. But usually there's so much reserve that patients don't notice after the muscle recovers. What I would say is that there are a few patients that tend to teeter on the brink of really severe dry eye. And these are the patients who have either a poor Bell's reflex or a fifth or seventh nerve palsy. So the Bell's reflex is a protective phenomenon. When a patient does eyelid closure, the eyeball actually superadducts, it moves upwards, and that's a protective reflex. This can be blunted in certain neurologic conditions like Parkinsonism. It can also be blunted in patients who have congenital eye muscle disorders. So these are patients where you wanna be very careful. Um, these are the patients who will get corneal ulcers if you give them even a half millimeter of black ophthalmos after surgery. Seventh and fifth nerve palsies. So either iatrogenic from you know, neurosurgery or uh, Bell's palsy or shingles, uh, both of these can obviously affect eyelid closure and blink. Uh, when comparing seventh and fifth nerve palsies, I actually find that a fifth nerve palsy, where you have an insensate cornea and inadequate reflexes to cause tear production, is actually much more impactful in terms of the patient experience of dry eye. So um, I'm not saying that you have to go and check everyone's corneal sensation before considering blepharoplasty, but at least ask them, have they had a history of shingles in the face? And uh, if they do, tread carefully. Um, the latter two, uh, so visual field, sometimes patients come in saying, I can't see things up top. And I don't know if that's because of my eyelids, you wanna make sure they haven't had a neurologic condition like a stroke. And of course you wanna screen out patients who have body dysmorphic disorder. So once you've eliminated these patients from your surgical practice, we can talk about surgery itself. So I like to go from the outside to the inside. You can choose whatever system that you like, but uh, for me, going from the skin to the muscles to the underlying fat helps me to make sure I think about all of the uh, appropriate factors. So when you have, when you're considering skin quality, there are two factors that you should think about. First is textural change, and the second is pigmentary change. So with textural change, you have either fine or deep rhytids. And fine rhytids are here. So this is actinic skin change. You cannot excise enough skin to pull these lines taut and eliminate them. That's a loser's battle, and that's how you get eyelid retraction. So if you want to get rid of these fine lines, in the periocular area, you have to consider doing some sort of skin resurfacing procedure. These heavier, deeper rhytids are really because of ptosis of the structure that's immediately superior to it, in this case, the brow. So you address those differently by either doing a brow lift to address this deep rhytid or doing skin resurfacing, in this case, laser for the superficial actinic rhytids that are in the periocular area. 
And you can see that as the laser is applied, you really get a nice contraction of the skin and then neocollagenesis. Uh, and this is the global view of that patient before and after. And you can see that you know, she had laser essentially to her full face and uh, you can really get a nice improvement in these perioral uh, and periocular uh, actinic changes along with the improvement in the deeper rhytids by actually lifting the upper facial totic structures. Pigment can also be improved with the chemical peels. So this is another kind of skin resurfacing procedure. Uh, reds and browns in particular respond well to TCA. So this patient had some reddish patchy discolorations, not just in the upper eyelids, but along the entire face. So as a nice adjunct, a little peel gets them some improvement in the skin quality. So skin resurfacing obviously is a topic entirely onto itself, but the idea is the deeper you go, the more powerful it is, but the more risky it is. So I, I do like to peel the upper eyelids at the margin, just below the uh, crease. And the reason for that is I feel like you get <clears throat> a little bit of lash eversion. So a lot of these patients with droopy eyelids have eyelash ptosis and the eyelashes go down and they blunt the light reflex on the cornea and it gives the eyes a bit of a dull color. So a little bit, just one pass of TCA compared to two to three passes in the lower eyelid just in this pre-tarsal skin allows for nice eyelash eversion. So I like to see at the end of my surgery that the eyelashes are pointing 90 degrees directly towards the ceiling, not up, not down, but 90 degrees. And that really helps evert the lashes postoperatively. So again, whether you're choosing laser or peels, the deeper you go, the more uh, powerful results you can get, but the more risky you are in terms of hyperpigmentation, et cetera. Um, I do urge you though, when you're considering a patient for upper blepharoplasty, ask yourself, what is their skin quality? And you can add these adjunctive procedures to really give your surgery a nice touch. Um, so if you wanna talk about incision design and the amount of skin that's excised, um, the ideal aesthetic goal nowadays, I feel is a bit different from what it may have been in the 80s and 90s. Now. Of course, I wasn't practicing in the 80s and 90s, but we've seen patients who've had surgery then, and they really had a lot of skin excision uh, at that time. So I want to introduce this concept that I didn't invent. Um, you know, perhaps Hamza and my mentor, Bob Goldberg, was one of the ones to create or popularize this, but the idea of tarsal platform show. So the tarsus is the cartilaginous backbone of the eyelid. So the tarsal platform show is how much of the eyelid is seen from the lashes to the crease. And that really is what patients notice. They don't notice so much the skin. They don't notice ptosis. They don't notice brow ptosis. What they compare is the amount of eyelid that they see here versus the amount of eyelid that they see here. And they say, oh, this one is drooping more. So in our surgical planning, we want to have a symmetric tarsal platform at the end of surgery. We also want to have an appropriate tarsal platform for that patient's look and their ethnicity. So Asians want much less tarsal platform, perhaps four to five millimeters. Even in Caucasian patients nowadays, the ideal look is to have maybe five to eight millimeters of tarsal platform, whereas previously you would try to excise every millimeter of skin that you could without giving them lagophthalmos to have a nice long tarsal platform. So you need to keep in mind based on their old photos, how full they were and not change their look dramatically if that's not what they want. So again, with Asians, if you give them too much of a tarsal platform, then it really, uh, it, uh, it westernizes their eyelid, not in a good way. So, uh, you know, a lot of revisional Asian eyelid surgeries because you want to try and lower the crease from a crease that's been raised too high from the initial surgery. So incision design, I like to start a little bit medial to the punctum. I take the incision out to the lateral canthus, but not past the lateral canthus. So if they have skin that they uh, you know, want taken out past the lateral canthus, I tell them they need a brow lift and we'll talk about that later. Um, you can see here that I've marked the junction between the brow skin and the eyelid skin. And in women in particular, this is important because where the cilia are is not where the brow ends. So with blepharoplasty, I hardly ever pay attention to how much skin is taken out here. I pay attention to how much skin is left. 
you want between 20 to 24 millimeters of skin left from the brow to the lashes after your skin excision. So if you take the brow position to be where the cilia are, you may end up with an over-aggressive excision in lagophthalmus. So I do like to mark that area. Um, the other thing I'll make note of is where to make this lower incision. You can make it along the eyelid crease, but oftentimes when patients present for blepharoplasty, their natural eyelid crease has migrated superiorly. So what used to be at eight to 10 millimeters has slipped to 12, 14, or even more. And these are patients that often need ptosis surgery, which is the other big thing that we'll talk about. And if you do ptosis surgery, you're going to lower their crease anyway. So uh, in general, I don't often pay too close attention to where their current crease is preoperatively. I like to put the crease where I want the crease to be. So in a Western eyelid, maybe between eight to 10 millimeters, and in an Asian eyelid between four to six millimeters, assuming that over time, the crease will migrate more superiorly as time goes on. So this is an example of that crease that rides upwards over time. So this patient came in, she said she had droopy eyelids. I did blepharoplasty and ptosis surgery for her. And you can see that her crease before surgery is almost you know, 18, 20 millimeters from the eyelash margin. So you know, it would be foolish to put the crease all the way up here. You really have to put the lower border of that blepharoplasty incision where you want the crease to be. So after ptosis surgery, you see the crease is now, you know, maybe at 10 or 12 millimeters compared to almost twice that preoperatively. So that's something to pay attention to as you're designing this incision. So now I'll talk about three things that really uh, I find are the main cause for patient dissatisfaction after blepharoplasty. And the, uh, you know, one of the main conditions is not recognizing upper eyelid ptosis. And ptosis surgery done without blepharoplasty is tolerable. So you can see this patient, I'd only raised his eyelids. I didn't take any skin out from the upper eyelids. And he has a passable result. He sees better. He looks a little bit better. It's not the perfect aesthetic result, but he's happy. You know, obviously he has some brow ptosis, lower lid fat, et cetera, but he was happy. It's tolerable. It didn't change his overall look. This is a case from early on in my fellowship where I did not recognize the ptosis. I only did skin excision and this skeletonizes and feminizes the eyelid. This is kind of a disastrous look. And if I gave a patient this kind of look in my practice today, they would be very unhappy. So um, ptosis surgery done without blepharoplasty is passable. Blepharoplasty done without ptosis surgery in a patient who needs it really can be a disaster. And patients don't know about ptosis versus dermatoclosis. They really have no clue. They come and they say, my eyelids are heavy and your job is to figure out who needs what. And if you're going to be a phenomenal blepharoplasty surgeon, you have to learn at least one method of addressing eyelid ptosis in the mild to moderate cases. And this is one technique that's uh, you know, pretty accessible for most surgeons. It's the posterior uh, conjunctival mularectomy, the Putterman procedure. You don't really have to do any measuring. You just grasp conjunctiva and Mueller's muscle in the clamp and excise. You can see that I've threaded a chromic suture and that's it. It's a very simple procedure. If you want to be a little bit more adventurous, you can do a levator advancement where you have the tarsus here. You have the levator aponeurosis here. You can find these structures as you lift up the central fat pad or the preaponeurotic fat pad. And then you can see that there's a dehiscence and you see Mueller's muscle in between with the dehisced levator edge and the tarsus. And you can attach the tarsus to the levator at the desired uh, you know, inflection point. And both of those are totally acceptable, appropriate ways of addressing ptosis. But if you don't address ptosis, again, you can have a very disastrous result. If you do address ptosis, so this is a similar patient, again, came complaining of droopy eyelids. If I had just done blepharoplasty, she would have turned out like that patient from early on in the fellowship. She would have had a long tarsal platform show without a brightness in the eyes. But now that I did combination ptosis and eyelid surgery, we actually didn't change the amount of tarsal platform that she sees at all, but she looks more refreshed. The eyes are more open. You see more of the colored part of her eyes, and this is a happy patient. So 
This mild to moderate ptosis is very easily addressed by the posterior conjunctival Miller's approach. That does not require cooperation. It doesn't require you to have them open their eyes. You can do it under general anesthesia. It takes 10 to 15 minutes and there's no measuring involved. So um, that's probably a great entry for people who want to get more involved in eyelid surgery to do mild to moderate ptosis surgery. And nowadays I probably throw in a very small posterior conjunctival Miller's ptosis surgery in about 90 to 95% of my blepharoplasty patients. Because the nice thing with that surgery is it's really hard to make them too high. Even if they're just a half millimeter low, it'll take them just that half millimeter up. So it's hard to give them a complication like lag of thalmos with that particular surgery. And the other issue with blepharoplasty and ptosis is that this is a patient who had had blepharoplasty elsewhere. And then the surgeon had tried to revise this right upper eyelid. She came to me saying, hey doc, I have too much skin on this right upper eyelid. Can you fix it? My prior surgeon tried twice and he still left too much skin. The key here is to recognize that it's not that she has a skin excess problem. She had a release inadvertently of the levator aponeurosis attachments to the skin and she lost her eyelid crease. So if you just took out more skin, you would end up giving her lag ophthalmos. What I did was I did a very small ptosis surgery. I reattached the levator to the skin and then I took out a tiny pinch of skin. So this theoretically falls under revisional upper eyelid blepharoplasty, but if you're not comfortable working with the levator, it's really hard to make a patient like this better. So um, I urge you to really consider ptosis uh, in all of your patients who present with upper blepharoplasty. So the other main reason for patient dissatisfaction after upper blepharoplasty is failure to address brow ptosis. <clears throat> so I show this picture to every single patient who's coming for upper, upper blepharoplasty to me. And what I tell them is this patient had a quad bleph. She was very happy with her results, but I told her she needed a brow lift. This brow was fine. This brow is totic. And after surgery, you can really dramatically see what the difference is in a blepharoplasty where the brow is appropriate versus where the brow is totic. And you see that you really cannot get improvement in that tarsal platform by just blepharoplasty when you have brow ptosis. In fact, the lateral hooding and the tarsal platform is worse after surgery because in doing the skin excision, you actually pull the brow down closer towards the eyelid margin. So um, I think it's really critical to look for brow ptosis in every single patient who has a concern about droopy eyelids. And in fact, in my practice, I have patients who decline a brow lift, sign a form that says, Dr. Ramesh told me I needed brow ptosis repair. I am declining it and proceeding only with upper blepharoplasty because they really will be unhappy if you don't show them a picture like this and say, this is what the result is gonna be if you don't lift the brow. Are you okay with that? <clears throat> These are some less dramatic examples. You can see that the lateral hooding is slightly accentuated with blepharoplasty alone. And the other way I like to explain it to patients is that if, if they just want their skin to be out of the way of their eyelashes, if they wanna see a little bit better, blepharoplasty alone is great. This patient was happy. But if they want to be able to apply an even amount of eyeshadow or eyeliner all the way across the eyelid, especially laterally, then they need a brow lift because you're not going to get a smooth tarsal platform without it. You're going to have a taper as the eyelids go laterally. And this picture really helps them understand and you know, ask themselves if they're okay with a result like this. So there are a few ways to do brow ptosis repair. Often in men, I'll do a direct brow lift uh, they have often deep facial right aids, and all you have to do is take out a strip of uh, skin and dermis and suture it back together. The thing I'll point out to you is that you notice I'm really staying laterally. I'm going quite far laterally because it's really the lateral brow that you want to lift. And these are men who've had upper blepharoplasty with direct brow lift. You really, again, won't get clearance of this lateral canthal area without picking the brow up, especially in this patient this difference in skin excess is not because of so much more dramatic cholesis that he has on the left side, it's because of that subtle brow ptosis. So doing a little direct brow lift really gives you a nice symmetric result. With women, I usually prefer uh, 
with women, I usually prefer an endoscopic brow lift. So, you know, there are any number of ways to do that. But um, as you go into the uh, temporal incision, you see over the deep temporalis fat pad, we have Yasserko's fat pad, we have the sentinel vein. And usually within one to two millimeters of this is where the frontal branch of the facial nerve resides above your retractor. And the key is to release the brow. So this is the superficial temporal fusion line or the conjoint tendon. Um, and uh, this is the arcus marginalis. So this is where you want to do your release. And I like to do my release more laterally than medially. And in fact, I've even stopped going so far medial to the supraorbital neurovascular bundle. So all of this periosteal tissue needs to be released. And once you release it, you can get a nice elevation of the tail of the brow and you can get some really um, fantastic and symmetric results. And again, these are not patients who come telling you my brow is droopy. They come telling you I have droopy eyelids. This patient doesn't even have eyebrows before surgery. But if you want to lift all of that heavy brow fat pad out of the eyelid, if you want an even tarsal platform, you have to offer a brow lift. And uh, again, this really accentuates the fact that to address this tapering tarsal platform and get an even amount of show all the way across, you have to do brow lift along with blepharoplasty. This is one more picture that I show nearly all my patients. She came to me for droopy upper eyelids and I did not touch her eyelids. All I did was an endoscopic brow lift. And this again reiterates the power of brow lifting in controlling tarsal platform because medially you can see she has probably an appropriate amount of tarsal platform for what her look was prior to the ptosis. So I don't want to give her so much more eyelid showing medially. I just want to make this amount persist across the whole eyelid. So that three to four millimeters, I wanna have that all the way across. And a brow lift was a great way to do it without touching the eyelids. So really think about eyelid ptosis, really think about eyebrow ptosis in all your blepharoplasty patients. They're part and parcel of the same problem. And finally, the last issue that leaves patients dissatisfied with blepharoplasty is superior sulcus deformity or fat loss or over aggressive fat excision. So um, the medial fat pad is different embryologically and biochemically from the central fat pad. So the medial fat pad persists with age, the central fat pad atrophies and slips back into the orbit. And that's because the medial fat pad has a different embryologic origin. It has more stem cells, it's neural crest derived. So rather than throwing away this fat and making the patient hollow all the way across, you can actually move this medial fat centrally and you can actually reinflate that superior sulcus area to give a better volume result. So, that's one way to get more volume here. The other way is to actually do ptosis surgery. So lifting the eyelid pushes that preaponeurotic fat pad farther into the orbit and revolumizes this area. And the last way to revolumize a deep superior sulcus is to actually do fat transfer. So this patient came for a droopy eyelid here. She has so much volume loss that you can almost see her bone. So we did a few adjunctive procedures for her, ptosis surgery, blepharoplasty, and I did facial fat transfer and the fat transfer to reinflate that brow fat pad and the superior sulcus region really gives a nice result because you hide that bone and you hide that dark shadow. And uh, to be honest, this patient could have used even a little bit more fat in the superior sulcus here, but you can always fill that later. So um, again, keeping fat and making sure this area stays volumized, lifting the upper eyelid, and lifting the tail of the brow when necessary are probably the three most important adjective procedures that you can add to your blepharoplasty to take your results from really good to exceptional. So with that, I thank you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Dr. Ramesh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, Cameron, have you got any questions on your side? Uh, no, Dion, I'm kind of just in awe of a great talk here. Very, very smooth, Deepak. Thank you so much, eh? Thank you. Can I, can I perhaps lead with a question here, Deepak? Sure. Um, firstly, I'd like to comment on the quality of your photographs. It's excellent. Thank you very much. 
Um, just a, a simple question: the uh, pretas or the the the, the uh, preoperonotic fat is an old staple uh, in plastic surgery to be removed or not removed. You didn't emphasize much. I think you emphasized the fact that it atrophies and one can move fat from medial to lateral. But um, do you ever remove fat from the upper eyelid? And what would your indications be? That is a good question. So with uh, this patient, in Asian blepharoplasty, I may remove a tiny little bit of fat because those patients tend to have so much fat. They actually have sub cutaneous fat, they have suborbicularis fat, they have fat within the septum, that they don't miss removing a little bit of fat from that preaponeurotic fat pad. Almost never in other patients do I remove preaponeurotic fat. If they have a little bit that's pooching out at the end of surgery, I may touch it with the bovi and encourage it to retract a little bit. But I found that not removing it hasn't really led to really full upper eyelids. Um, I've tried one thing where I take this central fat pad and you can, if they have too much, you can either move it superiorly and attach it to the brow fat, or you can try and, uh, you know, swing that even further laterally to just redistribute the volume because eventually people end up getting volume atrophy, particularly in the tail of the brow. So given that it's a vascularized healthy fat pedicle that, you know, should stay for many years, I try to use it rather than uh, throw it away if I can in any way. That's an excellent answer. Any questions, um, uh, Cam? Because I've yeah, got a few more. Fact, if you there's, need them. there's a question come through from uh, Susanna Venezuela. She's an excellent presentation. Could you repeat the simplest technique for a look? It seems to me that it's eyelid prosista. I'm presenting a ptosis, eyelid ptosis, please. The eyelid simplest ptosis. technique. She's from actually from Mexico, Susanna from Mexico. Yes, yes. So the simplest technique is a um, conjunctival neurosectomy. So let me share this video here. So this is a posterior approach ptosis surgery. This is the entire video that, that I didn't show before, but you can mark about seven to eight millimeters of conjunctiva and Mueller's muscle, and you attach this uh, Putterman clamp to it. Um, you can get this clamp anywhere. And then the idea is the clamp is the amount of tissue that you're going to excise. And with the suture, all you're doing is you're pre-placing a running suture underneath the clamp so that when you excise the tissue inside the clamp, the tissues are already sutured together. So the clamp is lifted up. You pass the suture in a serpentine fashion back and forth underneath the clamp. You can externalize the suture, you can tie it, you know, underneath the conjunctiva, which is what I do. Um, but I went all the way back and then I went back once more so that the suture really is putting those tissues together. And then here I tie it off. And then with a 15 blade, you can just excise the enclamped tissue. Now, the nice thing about this surgery is that you really don't have a lot of control over it. So that may be kind of surprising you know, a surgeon not wanting control over the surgery, but this surgery, it's hard to mess up two things. It's hard to mess up the contour and it's hard to mess up the amount of uh, elevation that you get. So in general, if you do a posterior process to approach ptosis surgery, the eyelid is going to go up, the eyelids are going to be symmetric and the contour is going to be good and it's going to be better than where you started. It may not be up as high as you want it, but if you're starting out, you don't really care about as high as you want. You just want it to be better. And it's really hard to mess up the contour or give them a complication with this method. Whereas with levator surgery, the contour can change dramatically depending on where you place your sutures. The eyelid position can, can also change dramatically depending on where you place your sutures. So um, this is probably a great entry into ptosis surgery. And actually in the 50s, this surgery was developed so that surgeons who are not comfortable with levator anatomy could start doing ptosis surgery. So I think it's a great way to get into it. Awesome, thanks Deepak. Susanna actually says, thank you very much. Um, Sebastian wants to know, can we have a talk on advanced ptosis to moderate and severe? Sebastian, we hear you on that. Uh, we limited at the moment to how much we can speak about, but in July next year, make sure you come to South Africa because there's gonna be a fantastic Congress from the 22nd to the 25th of July next year. 
go on a safari afterwards, have the garden route before, <laughs> make that date. Okay, question from Ernest Moller, would like to know, uh, great talk, thank you. Can you comment on totic lacrimal gland and how you manage that? That's a great question. I wish I had a video to show you, um, but uh, totic lacrimal gland is actually relatively easy to manage. So when you're in the lateral part of the blepharoplasty incision, all you have to do is take a little circle of the orbicularis muscle out and you'll see the lacrimal gland pretty easily. I use a floral or a fiber vicro suture and I tuck it just underneath the superior orbital rim, grabbing the periosteum and that will swing that gland back where it belongs. And it's a very straightforward procedure for anyone to do. The only thing I would count, uh, counsel you on is that the gland has some arteries in it that tend to bleed that are hard to stop. It's similar to parotid or submandibular gland in texture. So uh, it's not really conducive to cautery and things like that. So that may be the only difficulty you run into, but all bleeding stops. Okay. Awesome, Deepak, the questions are rolling in on YouTube as well now. Eh? Um, the, one question was from Abel wants to know, what kind of suture do you use? It, to close blepharoplasties, I typically use non-absorbing sutures, not because I think the end cosmetic result is better. You know, I used to use a lot of 6-0 pain gut suture, but I switched to 6-0 proline. The reason being some of these patients, especially the cosmetic patients, are really finicky about the milia that come due to the absorbing sutures. So milia will go away in three months, but for three months, they're bothering you about these little dots and bumps. So I find it easier just to take the suture out of the week. They don't have that issue. And uh, the, when, you, when you're removing the, uh, for the mitosis, what are you using there? A 6 chromic suture. 6 chromic um, Okay, Manoj would like to know any clinical test to decide preoperatively if both ptosis correction and blepharoplasty is needed? I think if you put a drop of 2.5% phenylephrine into each eye and you like what it does as far as opening the eyes, then a posterior approach ptosis surgery will serve you very well. Um, even if it doesn't work that well, the surgery can still work, but at least you kind of have a, uh, an idea of what the result may be if the phenylephrine drop raises the eyelid appropriately. Awesome. Okay, Danilo would like to know, um, how high do you set your electrocautery for the excision? You know, I think with different machines, it's different, but with my Covidian set, I set it at 12 across. So uh, in whatever that's comparable to. Cool. Okay, one more question here from Ravish. He'd like to know, please explain about levator advancement in detail. So I, I can I can just uh, show you this that that video just a little bit um, again. But the the surgery itself is anatomically straightforward. You have the tarsus here. You have the dehist levator aponeurosis here you have a gap between the tarsus and the levator aponeurosis. And underneath that, you can see Muller's muscle. This aponeurosis can be found by lifting up the pre-aponeurotic fat pad. And if you go even further posteriorly, you'll see the, uh, the levator muscle. So your goal is to reattach this so that the tension adjusts the height and the contour of the upper eyelid to your taste. So for this, the patient really needs to be awake so that you can have them open your eyes, you can see what the contour is. Um, it's finicky at times. Yeah, I would say more than half the time, I have to put in these sutures multiple times and take them out to get exactly the result they want. And even after that, they, if they're great on the table, some patients post-op week one may still need some adjustment. So it's tricky. Give yourself some time to learn it. Uh, but at its fundamental, that's the essential idea. Awesome. Okay. Deepak, one last question, actually from our colleague just down the road in Port Elizabeth. Uh, South Africa is Derek Udnadal. He'd like to know, what is the name of the clamp that you're using? So the clamp, you can, you can find it as a Putterman clamp or a Tosis clamp. Uh, probably Putterman clamp is uh, more specific to get you the exact clamp that you want, but you can even use a curved, curved hemostat. The idea is just to grab the conjunctiva and Mueller's tissue above the tarsus. Fantastic. Um, Deepak, thank you so much. Dion, over to you, eh? Deepak, I think we've got uh, one minute and I'm going to use the privilege of asking you a question. Um, uh, do you do anything to the orbicularis oculi muscle? Because we were taught as trainees years ago to remove some muscle 
So that's the one question I want to ask. And then the other thing is, under what circumstances, if ever, do you remove retroorbicularis oculi um, fat? And do you do internal brow suspensions for, through a blepharoplasty? Those are great questions. So regarding removal of orbicularis muscle, I may remove orbicularis in patients who have concurrent blepharospasm or hemifacial spasm. I hardly ever remove it otherwise because there have been a few papers that show that there's no real cosmetic difference. There was even a split face trial done in China where they took orbicularis on one side and skin only on the other. There was really no cosmetic difference. So I feel like having the extra muscle around for blink is more important than any potential cosmetic benefit that I may achieve afterwards. Now, your second question about the retroorbicularis oculi fat pad or the brow fat pad, I remove it only in cases of patients with thyroid eye disease where the fat has grown beyond what is normal. I find that over time, most patients have an atrophy of that fat pad, which is why we often do filler to the tail of the brow. So if it's something that's going to be revolumized anyway in 10 or 20 years, I tell them, you're not going to like me if I debulk this extensively right now, even if it looks good for three months or six months. And then the last question is the internal brow suspension through a blepharoplasty. Yeah, I, I sometimes do that when a patient really refuses a brow ptosis surgery and I feel like they really need it. I don't know that it really lifts the brow, but it keeps it from getting worse. And at least for the you know, six to 12 weeks that I'm seeing them in my office, it looks a lot better. So you know, eventually when it gets totic, then they don't mind it as much. So <laughs> I like an honest surgeon, <laughs> Deepak. That was an excellent talk. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was a good review and lots of tips and pulls. So thank you very much. Thank um, you. I think if you have nothing more to say, then I'm going to ask Mr. to, to uh, lead his talk. Thank you very much, Deepak. Bye.